the powerful storms hitting both coasts. Oh, finally, the big snowstorm of the year. Oh, it's like heavy, heavy, heavy snow, about a foot, and it's still snowing. Heavy snow and high winds as a nor'easter knocks out power to hundreds of thousands across the northeast, and a second atmospheric river leaves California drenched with heavy rain and flash flood watches. Plus, I don't know that they're better days. I just think they're just days, you know. It's a loss felt by the mothers of so many rappers. But why are gun violence deaths happening so often in the rap community? And what is being done to stop it? And, and it just felt wrong. I was thinking, there's no way he's touching me like that. I'm imagining this. The world-class runner who is now going public with allegations of sexual assault against her former coach. She tells her story to Lindsay Davis. Good evening, everybody. I'm Kena Whitworth in for Lindsay Davis tonight, and thank you so much for streaming with us. And we are following those stories and much, much more, including the bank run and now the fallout as multiple investigations are launched into why Silicon Valley Bank failed and Moody's put six other banks on downgrade watch. So we'll talk to Moody's chief economist. Also, the major lawsuit filed today by the state of Ohio against Norfolk Southern after last month's toxic train derailment and the allegations the railroad put the residents of East Palestine at risk. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering all of this for us tonight. But we begin with the dramatic incident over the Black Sea. Russian fighter jets colliding with an unmanned American drone. And tonight, concerns this could increase the already high tensions between the U.S. and Russia. The two Russian fighter planes moved in to intercept the Predator surveillance drone today as it was flying in international airspace doing 19 close passes. So the White House accused the pilots of being reckless and unprofessional. The Air Force says the jets also dumped fuel on the drone and hit its propellers, forcing it down into the water. Now, this is not the first time the Russian military aircraft has used this kind of tactic. So what is Russia saying about the incident and what comes next? Here is our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raditz. The U.S. Reaper surveillance drone was flying in international airspace over the Black Sea when the Russian fighter jets rapidly approached and began what would be more than 30 minutes of reckless aerial harassment, much like this encounter with the U.S. B-52 bomber in 2020. Interceptions are common, but never before like this. Not only did the Russians shadow the drone, they made 19 close passes, sprayed fuel on the unmanned aircraft multiple times, while one of the jets pulling up vertically as it approached the drone, then colliding with the drone's rear propeller. They collided with the aircraft, damaging the propeller, uh, and essentially uh, putting in a situation where it was unflyable and uncontrollable, so we brought it down. The U.S. then crashing the drone into the Black Sea. The Pentagon saying the Russian fighter jet that hit it was damaged but managed to land. The big question, was this simply a reckless interception that got out of control or was the collision done on purpose? It's clear that it was unsafe, unprofessional. Um, and I think the actions speak for themselves. The Russians are claiming the drone was flying southwest of the Crimean Peninsula toward Russia's border and crashed because of sharp maneuvering and that the Russian jets never came into physical contact with the drone. The Pentagon says the downed drone has not been recovered by either side. Late today, the U.S. summoning Russia's ambassador to the State Department, the White House, saying that's part of keeping diplomatic lines open. That's why you want the lines of communication open so that you can actually have those kinds of very direct interchanges uh, and lay bare and lay clean uh, what your concerns are. And Martha Raddatz is joining me now from Washington. Martha, you're learning new details about not only this downed drone, but the Russian pilots as well. What can you tell us? It, exactly, Kenya. Ex uh, it, despite the fact that the drone's propeller was bent, they were able to guide it into the Black Sea, far away from where the collision actually happened, so they hope they can recover it. And tonight, a U.S. Air Force official is telling us they do not think the Russian pilot uh, collided with that drone on purpose. They say it wasn't intentional, but they say instead it was pure incompetence and flat-out dumb on the part of the Russian pilot. Kena? Wow, interesting details. Martha Raditzer, thanks to you.
Next tonight to the nor'easter, moving its way all the way up the east coast. Heavy snow, rain, gusting winds, some of them up to 60 miles an hour from Philadelphia to New York to Boston. More than two feet of snow reported in parts of New York, Massachusetts, and Vermont, and the system will stay in the area until tomorrow. Now, our Ginger Z is standing by with the forecast, but first, Trevor All is reporting tonight from Situate, Massachusetts. Tonight, a treacherous drive home for millions in the grip of a powerful nor'easter. Cars fishtailing in New Hampshire. Part of Interstate 93 shut down for a time, power lines blocking the road. We just came to a complete stop, um, and that was about an hour ago. Cement-like snow weighing down trees. Look at that, completely over the interstate. And taking down power lines across the northeast, putting hundreds of thousands in the dark. In some spots, nearly three feet of snow already, with hours still to go. It's really heavy, really heavy snow, heavier than usual. Moving it feels like, you know, it's a workout. At a snowy Syracuse airport, a Delta flight went off the taxiway. Fortunately, no one was hurt. You felt us kind of glide to the left a little bit, and then it felt as if we were kind of on rumble strips, similar to on the highway. And on the coast, winds gusting up to 60 miles an hour. At high tide in Situate, Massachusetts, officials bracing for flooding. Is this the worst storm of the season for you? Definitely the worst storm of the season. This is kind of the perfect storm with the wind, the rain, the snow, and the tides. Air travel disrupted across the country. More than 4,000 flights delayed and 1,000 flights canceled so far. And Kana, these massive wind gusts are throwing the waves into the seawall up and over. There's already some flooding on the other side, and the storm continues through the rest of tonight into tomorrow morning. Kana. And our thanks to you, Trevor. Also, now our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, is joining us now. And Ginger, time this all out for us. Yes, Kana, we've still got at least 12 hours left. We are getting the gusts upwards of 40 miles per hour here, and it will impact travel not just at the coast, but where that heavy snow is still falling. 33 inches, the top snow total so far. That was in Hawley, Massachusetts. A couple of spots that are closing in on three feet. And I say so far because you see the map there. The low is still rotating just off of eastern Mass Massachusetts and New Hampshire there, uh, parts of Maine. But that's going to take its time with those wraparound snow showers, and eventually the winds will start to loosen by tomorrow morning. Now, within that, you could see one to three inch per hour snowfall rates. You could see gusts upwards of 65 miles per hour. Air travel certainly going to be impacted even into early tomorrow morning into New England. And then as that thing finally pulls away, we will loosen the winds by tomorrow afternoon for everyone. Then let's go west because we still have to talk about what's to come for Los Angeles yet tonight. We've seen more than three and a half inches of rain in San Luis Obispo County just today. And so when you have those types of rainfall rates, one inch per hour, and you're talking about Anaheim, California, or San Diego, down to the Mexican border, we are surging well beyond average even in Southern California because we know Northern had such a big uh, big season so far, Kena, mm -hmm. but now we're including Southern California too. All right, Ginger, thank you. It just has felt relentless out here. We appreciate you. And as you just saw there with Ginger, this atmospheric river is slamming the West. It's bringing very real concerns to millions of Californians. And tonight, there is a rare high-risk flood alert in Los Angeles. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, is in Montecito with the latest. Tonight, that atmospheric river roaring into Southern California, pelting it with more heavy rains and strong winds. It's expected to bring two to four inches of rain in some areas. NOAA issuing a rare high flood risk warning. We rode with Mark Van Tillo of the Santa Barbara Fire Department to inspect swollen streams. The ground is so saturated already that everything is running off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, even, you know, wherever it, it's just not soaking in anymore. We're 100% saturated and we have more coming. Waterlogged Monterey County also bracing for more dangerous floods. That just days after a levee breach on the swollen Pajaro River sparked rescues and forced thousands from their homes. Crews now racing to make levee repairs. The flooding also shutting down parts of scenic Highway 1, which links Monterey and Santa Cruz after rushing waters eroded an embankment. Our Rob Marciano is in Northern California. It's really been coming down here all morning long in Santa Cruz in a county really that can't take any more water. In the Bay Area, the back-to-back -back storms taking down trees and power lines. This elementary school also saying a student suffered a minor head injury after a redwood fell in her classroom. It's just been really hard for everybody out here in California. Matt Gutman is joining us now. So, Matt, you're there in Montecito. Is that a debris basin right behind you? 
It's exactly what it is, and it's designed, Kena, to catch those giant boulders and logs that come tumbling down the mountain. In the past, of course, they have wreaked havoc in this town. Mudslides in 2018, causing 23 deaths here. So they built this thing, and the water is designed to go through that concrete filter, and then it jets out on the other side. Mm -hmm. Officials really do expect this one to hold as the heaviest rain is forecast in the coming hours. And, of course, there is that flood watch in effect all the way from Los Angeles to San Francisco uh, through tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, this area can't take that much more moisture. There is significant concern for mudslides here. Okay, now. Matt, thank you. You know better than anyone else. They've been saying they can't take much more for a very long time, Matt. We appreciate you. Now to the latest developments in the collapse of two U.S. banks, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. The Justice Department and the SEC today launched separate investigations into why SVB failed. It comes amid new concerns about the stability of America's banking system. So here is Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, just days after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank sparked fears of a wider banking crisis, the Justice Department and the SEC launching separate investigations. Silicon Valley Bank was not a traditional regional bank. It was rapid growth. It was poorly managed. Sources telling ABC News that part of the FBI's early focus will be looking into whether any of Silicon Valley's senior leadership got unusual bonuses or sold stocks in the days leading up to the bank's collapse. In short, is there any evidence of insider trading? We must get the full accounting of what happened and why those responsible can be held accountable. No one is above the law. Senator Elizabeth Warren now arguing any executive bonuses and stock sales should be taken back from those bankers. They took on all that risk, made themselves more profitable right up to the day that the bank exploded. And tonight, critics, including Senator Warren, point out it was easier for Silicon Valley to fly under the radar of regulators because regulations of these banks were rolled back by President Trump just 10 years after the biggest banking collapse in U.S. history. Rolled back with support from Republicans and some Democrats in Congress. And because of that, the bank no longer had to pass those key bank stress tests. These reforms are critical to helping all Americans thrive and to prosper. And for the first time, we're seeing the failed CEO of the Silicon Valley Bank addressing his employees last Friday after the government took over the bank. I care so much about all of you. It really is just so incredibly difficult. No longer in control over his bank, making last-minute pleas for his employees to hang on. So I've got an ask, and it's a completely unfair ask. My unfair ask is this, can you guys just hang around, try to support each other, try to support our clients, work together, which may be a, again, a slightly better outcome than where we are right now. Quite a plea to his employees there. Pierre is joining us now. So Pierre, we should know that the bank CEO had lobbied to roll back some of these regulations, but what are authorities looking for now on what those Silicon Valley executives knew ahead of the bank's collapse? Well, Cannon, the CEO did in fact write a letter to Congress pushing to roll back those regulations. And tonight what the FBI wants to know is when did the bank leadership first understand that they were on the brink of collapse? And Kana, what did they do about it? Important questions, Pierre. Thank you. And noting tonight that Moody's Investor Service today cut its outlook for the entire U.S. banking system from stable to negative, citing the, quote, rapidly deteriorating operating environment. So for more on the state of the nation's banks and the economy, I'm joined by Mark Zandi, the chief economist for Moody's Analytics. And Mark, thank you so much for being here. Look, I know you're not on the rating side of this, but can you help us understand the health of the nation's banks? I, I think it's fair to say that in a world of rising interest rates, high interest rates, uh, it's going to put pressure on the banking system, and uh, some banks are going to have some tr uh, trouble with that, which we've seen over the past couple of days. But I will also say that, in uh, I think broadly speaking, the banking system is on very solid financial ground. Uh, mm. Lots of capital with the government action to support the banking system and the Fed Senate staying up a credit facility to provide additional liquidity to the banking system. That that's all good, and credit quality is very good. So I, you know, I feel confident that the banking system is on very solid, as I said, financial ground. And uh, I think depositors should feel very, very comfortable about their, their money in those banks. You do. So you feel like what you think the bank is on solid ground and you think the depositors, the average American should have confidence? 
I do indeed. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, when the Fed, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, which is the institution that regulates the banks and has the deposit insurance fund for the depositors, and the Treasury Department of the administration stand up and, you know, uh, say, we've got the systems back. And I think uh, that should give us all confidence. And, and let me say, even without that backstop, you know, if you look objectively at the system as a whole, not any individual bank and, you know, because there's 4,700 banks, smallish, uh, mid-sized banks uh, that, you know, hard to uh, uh, to uh, paint with a broad brush. But broadly speaking, the system is uh, in very, very good shape. Okay. What about the latest reading on consumer inflation? So it came out this morning. This is an issue that many Americans are remaining focused on. We saw, you know, prices up six uh, percent compared to a year ago, but that number is in line with those expectations. So can you help us give us a sense of the data and what could it mean for inflation in the months ahead? Yeah. So inflation is high, uh, uncomfortably high. Six percent year over year uh, is high. It's coming in. It's moving in the right direction. The peak was back last summer, June of last year. We were at 9 percent. So we're moving in the right direction. But we need to get that down to something that's closer to 2 or 3 percent, you know, somewhere in that ballpark. That's what the Federal Reserve is trying to do by raising interest rates. And that's, uh, you know, clearly one of the root causes for the problems that uh, these banks had uh, over the pa past week, trying to digest those higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. But but uh, inflation is moving in the right direction. It's 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 slow, painfully slow. And I know for most American households, you know, it's, a, it's really cutting into their purchasing power. I'll give you one statistic. The average American household is spending $372 more a month than they were a year ago to buy the same goods and services. So that kind of gives you a sense of the stress. Hopefully by this time next year, inflation will be at a place where we're not we're not talking about it. Right, but I mean, almost $400 a month for families in America. I mean, that could be really devastating for some families. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, and on interest rates, the Federal Reserve set to meet again next week. Do you think they'll raise interest rates again? Or do you think that perhaps there's like a temporary pause because of the uncertainty right now? If, if I were on the uh, the committee deciding this, I'd say pause. I wouldn't raise rates. Uh, take a look around, you know, over the next few weeks. If the script uh, holds to my what I think it will, uh, yeah, then the Fed can re start resuming interest rate hikes again and get this economy and the inflation back to where it needs to be. Yeah, one last point: I, I, I don't think the Fed has a long way to go here. I, you know, this this banking crisis notwithstanding, I thought the Fed would have to raise rates another couple, three more times to you know get the rates where they need to be to get the economy and inflation back to where they need to be. So I, I think we're pretty close to the end of these rate hikes, one way or the other. All right. Well, Mark Zandi from Moody's Analytics, we really appreciate your insight on this. Thank you. Yeah, anytime. Thank you. Also tonight, the Ohio State District Attorney announcing today that the state will sue Norfolk Southern Railway over last month's toxic train derailment in East Palestine. In a 58-count complaint, the DA's office alleges the railway operator violated federal and state environmental laws as well as Ohio common law by, quote, recklessly endangering the health of residents and the environment. The lawsuit is said to address any economic and long-term health impacts that residents may experience due to that derailment. Also, the EPA has announced it will restrict cancer-causing forever chemicals known as PFAS. These forever chemicals, so they don't break down. They can actually seep into soil and water, and as many as 200 million Americans are exposed to these in their tap water. Now, last year, the EPA found that these chemicals can actually cause problems at a much lower level than they previously thought, and exposure to these chemicals over time has been linked to severe illnesses like cancer, liver damage, and high cholesterol. And we still have much more to get to here tonight on Prime. The major drug maker announcing plans to slash the price of insulin will tell you which company and how much patients can expect to save. Plus, trouble in the metaverse. As Mark Zuckerberg says, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram will lay off more workers. But next, a closer look at gun violence in the rap community from the many lives lost too soon to the mothers united in grief. It didn't really sink in. Um, and as I was moving through it, it still wasn't like, I didn't, it didn't hit until I actually saw his body, which was a few days in. Whenever news breaks, 
to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Bit a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back. Since the deaths of Tupac and the notorious B.I.G. in the 1990s, gun violence deaths have become more and more prevalent in the rap community. And it not only leaves behind devastated fans, but think about these grieving mothers grappling with insurmountable loss. In our ABC News Live special report, Tone Death, Loss and Hip Hop, ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi speaks to the mothers of Pop Smoke and T.Dot Wu as they try to find a way forward. And we explore what could be leading so many of these rappers to die so young, specifically from gun violence. Here's a preview. Police close off Las Vegas Boulevard as Tupac Shakur is rushed to the hospital. Violence, as American as apple pie. Police say it was a large gun that was used due to the size of the bullet holes. Hip hop reflects that. It's like a beef between the East and the West Coast. You know, when, when, when Pac died, I just couldn't believe it because I thought Pac was Superman. He sold about 20 million albums, one of the defining artists of hardcore gangster rap. We're still reeling from Tupac's death. Notorious Big, B-I-G, a notorious rap singer, uh, was shot and killed. I said, stop playing. Stop playing. I guess that's the reality of our society nowadays. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in the street and we die in the street. It's getting too violent. It's supposed to be singing about it, not supposed to be, you know, it shouldn't be that, it shouldn't be like that. It all felt very familiar, even though, you know, I didn't know Big. It felt like I knew him. And, and when he passed, it, it was just the sadness, you know what I'm saying? I definitely, like, shed a tear. Biggie Smalls from Best Style, I'm from Best Style, you know what I'm saying? We gonna keep it real, we gonna represent for Biggie Smalls. The deaths of Big and Tupac were the first prominent gun violence deaths in hip hop. Hip hop does not exist in a vacuum. There's all of this context. It's a part of this larger American culture and landscape. You know, rappers were just describing things that we see in every day on the way to school. And the violence in, in, in the music was just a reflection of, of what we saw. I remember back in the day, I think it was Chuck D who said, Hip hop is like the black CNN. It's reflecting what is going on? It's a Morse code. It's a way to disseminate information. And, and you know, the more people scrutinize it, the more it made, made us hold on to it tighter. I think it's really interesting with these younger rappers specifically, usually before they hit the age of 30, they've made pioneering influences in hip hop take off from Migos, PMB Rock. They pass so quickly, the shock value of that affects the human psyche. You have people who are entering the music industry directly from the street corner or the trap house. You don't have that in country music. You don't have that 
typically in R&B. You don't have that in rock. Nipsey Hussle wasn't the first one. It, it had, you know, Pop Smoke wasn't the first one. Like, again, it, it happens every day in our neighborhoods, you know what I'm saying, to, to countless just nameless young men and, and young women. So it's not a hip-hop problem. And this is why I say it's a larger systemic issue, right? We have to address these issues uh, that lead to criminality, poverty, lack of proper, you know, mental and physical health care, housing. From a grieving standpoint, a mother never gets over losing a child, like ever, no matter how long. I think the longer it goes, the worse it gets. I thought I had a handle on it. I think for something like this, it's forever. Audrey Jackson's photo album holds some of her last personal memories with her son before he died, a victim of gun violence. Bashar Jackson is my son. Pop Smoke, son of Audrey and Greg Jackson in Brooklyn Zone, was known to the world as the voice behind platinum selling hits like Welcome to the Party. Baby, welcome to the party. Uh, I hit the boy up and then I go skate. And the viral track Dior. Uh, Christian Dior, Dior. Many praised him as the next big hip hop star, the artist who would put New York rap back in the forefront. But he'd never see 11 of his songs go platinum or accept his five Billboard awards. I don't know that they're better days. I just think they're just days, you know. Maybe the better days in something like that is the day when I feel it, but it's not a loss, it's just a remembering. Then I got a phone call. And everything changed. Rapper Pop Smoke has died. Multiple suspects broke into a Hollywood Hills home this morning and shot the rapper. It's a call Audrey will never forget. The voice on the other line, Shiv, an A&R rep from Pop Smoke's label. You get a phone call. Can you walk me through it? I think Shiv said he's been shot, but he's okay. I just know people kept coming to the house, and even, even, even when folks kept coming, I was like, but he's okay, why are you all here? You know? Um, and then when Shiv came, he said that he was gone. And I was like, oh. It didn't really sink in. Um, and as I was moving through it, it still wasn't like, I didn't, it didn't hit until I actually saw his body, which was a few days in. I mean, intellectually, I understood. Mm -hmm. And that kind of still is where I am. You know, um, intellectually, I understand it. The rest of me uh, hasn't. On February 19th, 2020, Pop Smoke died at just 20 years old. That same week, his mixtape, Meet the Woo Volume 2, debuted at number seven on the Billboard 200 chart. Four suspects, including two minors, were charged with murder. I was never angry at that 14-year-old or the 17 and 16-year-old. I was never angry at them. Can't hate that little boy. Why not? Because his mom didn't raise him to go kill Pop Smoke. She was probably a mother having issues trying to raise a 14-year-old boy wherever it is, they, and just not being able to do it. So you see even parallels. You're raising your son in Brooklyn, New York. This mother who's raising a son in Los Angeles, you even see parallels. You raise your children to be the best that you understand. He kept saying, Mom, I'm working. I have a surprise for you. And you're going to see, I'm, I'm going to make you a proud mouth. <laughs> I saw him, and they were trying their best. But I know the anger where he got shot, I know he wouldn't survive. Did you ever find out what the surprise was? It was the deal, the record deal he wanted to tell me about. 
22 year old Tajay Dobson was killed Tuesday in Canarsie. It happened hours after he signed a contract with million dollar music under the stage name T. Wu. Nearly two years after Pop Smoke's death, T. Wu was shot outside his childhood home in Canarsie, Brooklyn. There is prevalent gun violence throughout different neighborhoods in Brooklyn, specifically Canarsie. Pop Smoke was from Canarsie. T. Dot was from Canarsie. Canarsie has a heavy, heavy population of gangs in New York and a prevalent issue with gun violence. Did we get out the car? Bonded by tragedy, Audrey and Zodia are now leaning on each other, moving forward together in their grief. When you guys first met and you first talked, what was that conversation like? She was oh. really just in the midst of me. Mm. Grief. grief. And you know, I always say to her, I need to stop saying it. I thought I wish I could grieve the way she grieves. Actually, more. Because she you know she just lets it go. I'm like, mm-mm, we're not doing that. Yeah. More like mm. keep it together. Right, because you see, I'm the kind of chick that would probably be in the middle of the street wailing if I let her go. Yeah. So, I, <laughs> so I, need to, I need to retain her. I also think it's harder for people to conceptualize the idea of rappers having fans families and friends and people who cared about them. A double XL magazine investigation found that since the deaths of Tupac and Biggie, more than 90 rappers have died from gun violence. Many of their cases remain unsolved. This is America. This is not hip hop, right? And that cannot continue to be the thing that we point the finger to. We need to have systemic change to change the communities that people are living in. And that is when we will see change in hip hop culture itself. Other rappers that have been shot and killed, when you hear that news, does it bring you back? Mm -hmm. Always bring me back, back to the day when it happened, always. It's painful, it's annoying, it's sad. Especially if they're the young men that, like, the, I, you know, that I've met and you're looking forward to the next conversation because they hold a story, you know, of my son. And so now they're gone. And when is it going to stop? Now you can see more of our talks with those mothers in New York, as well as revealing interviews from Chicago, including more from rapper G Herbo, Tone Death, Loss and Hip Hop streams tonight at 8.30 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. And you can watch it on Hulu starting tomorrow. Now still tonight, we have a lot more to get to. Coming up, it was the first Indian song to win an Oscar. So why is it causing such a controversy for what happened on stage at the Academy Awards? But next, the Ides of March are upon us and that means it's time to fill out your bracket. So what are the chances of perfection? Yeah, we'll take a closer look at those March Madness in By the Numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Two of the hottest rappers coming out of Atlanta. Young Thug and Gunna. Charged in a sweeping 56-count indictment. What is this? Rap is back on trial. You decide to admit your crimes over a beat, I'm going to use it. What is happening? There's lots of us locked up in prison. We're not going to let that happen on our watch. Not with hip-hop music, using our lyrics. We're going to fight back. Rap, trap, hip-hop on trial. Only on Hulu. It's 
so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Elephants are more like us than we ever thought possible. They speak to each other in ways we're just beginning to understand. It's not just noise. It's an ancient wisdom formed over generations. They'll share their secrets with us. If we only listen. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. It is the middle of March, and you know what that means. March Madness is ready to steal every sports fan's attention. So let's take a look tonight by the numbers. Ladies first, we begin with the number one seed in the women's NCAA tournament, the South Carolina Gamecocks. And with a perfect 32-0 record so far this season, the defending champs are the favorite to win the women's tournament for the second year in a row. And if they do, they will be the fourth program to repeat as champions and the fifth to close out an undefeated season. And on the men's side with a 29 and 5 record Alabama comes in as the number one overall seed with Houston Kansas and Purdue rounding out the top seeds and this tournament kicks off tonight with two of the first four games which will determine the final field of 64 for the tournament so take note that in 10 of the 11 tournaments that the first four playing games has existed at least one of those teams has gone on to advance to the second round and three have actually reached the sweet 16 but for the final four you're probably better off sticking with the favorites. In the past 10 tournaments, at least one number one seed has reached the final four, and at least two or two number one seeds have reached the final four in 30 of the past 37 tournaments. And as for your bracket, I mean, don't even think about getting it perfect, right? If you have a little basketball knowledge, the odds of picking every winner stand at one in 120, 120 billion um, but if you were just picking randomly for all 64 games, the odds actually jump to one in 9.2 quintillion. Okay, look, we had to look it up. Uh, quintillion equals a billion billion. So good luck to everybody out there. And much more ahead here on Prime. We'll talk about an elite long distance runner. And now Kara Goucher is going public about the sexual assault allegations that led to her coach's ban from the Olympic Games. She sits down with Lindsay Davis. Also, how to be a better human. Chris Duffy, the comedian and host of the popular podcast, stops by to talk about his self-improvement journey and what fans can expect this season. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice.
With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Another body in Boston. A killer held Boston in a state of fear. It was a crime spree that stumped police for years. Now, journey deep behind the deadly details. They had hundreds and hundreds of suspects. And into Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. And March 17th, watch Boston Strangler, starring Kira Knightley, streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Two of the hottest rappers, Young Thug and Gunna, charged in a sweeping 56-count indictment. What is this? What is happening? There's lots of us locked up in prison. Rap, trap, hip hop on trial. Only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back. Another drug maker is dropping the price of its insulin. A tech company announces thousands of new layoffs and the controversy of an Oscar-winning song. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Another major price cut for insulin. Drug maker Novo Nordisk says it will slash prices up to 75% next year following a similar move by Eli Lilly. For example, the cost of a vial of Novlog will drop from 289 to 72 bucks. The price of a flex pen will drop from more than $500 to 139. The federal government in January started applying a $35 cap on monthly out-of-pocket costs to patients with Medicare. More than 8 million Americans use insulin, according to the American Diabetes Association. Mark Zuckerberg has announced Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, will lay off 10,000 workers, roughly 13% of its workforce. The company let go of 11,000 people in November. It will also eliminate 5,000 open roles that have yet to be filled and plans a restructure of its tech and business groups. The social media company is seeing fewer ad sales and the overall tech industry is struggling to reorganize after the pandemic hiring surge. Tonight, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is likely running for president, declared protecting Ukraine against Russia is not in the vital national interest of the U.S. DeSantis saying, while the U.S. has many vital national interests, becoming further entangled in a territorial dispute between Ukraine and Russia is not one of them. He adds, the Biden administration's virtual blank check for as long as it takes distracts from our country's most pressing challenges. The White House today firing back. If we were just to lay back and let Putin take Ukraine, which, make no mistake, he hasn't pulled away from it. If we just lay back and let that happen, where does it stop? The sharpest critics of DeSantis's comments, his fellow Republicans. The last thing we need is, is a bully with nuclear weapons feeling like he's emboldened and that there's nobody keeping him in check. Senator John Cornyn saying he was disturbed by the DeSantis statement. Others implying the Florida governor is out of his depth. Well, I don't know what he's trying to do or what the goal is. Obviously, he doesn't deal with foreign policy every day as governor. But DeSantis is staking out a similar position as his potential top rival, former President Donald Trump, who has even suggested letting Russia take over parts of Ukraine. Shortly after I win the presidency, I will have the disastrous war between Russia and Ukraine settled. It'll take 24 hours. 
A major recall for pet owners. Omega-3 supplements for cats and dogs sold under multiple brands by major retailers, including Amazon and Chewy. Manufacturer Stratford USA says they may contain elevated levels of vitamin A, which can lead to health issues. Pet owners should throw the containers away. It was an historic win at the Academy Awards. Natu Natu became the first Indian song to win an Oscar for Best Original Song, but not without controversy. During a performance of the song at the Oscars, not a single South Asian was on stage. Natu Natu from the Tollywood film RRR became known for its iconic dance moves and choreography rooted in South Indian folk dance style. The main actors who danced in the movie were in attendance but did not perform. Some South Asian dancers have posted to social media expressing their frustration. Lindsay Lohan is pregnant. The 36-year-old Parent Trap star announced on Instagram she's expecting her first baby with husband Baber Shamas. She captioned the photo of the onesie, we are blessed and excited. Lohan married the financier last July. A representative for the pregnant actress tells ABC News Lohan is very excited for this new chapter. And next to an elite American runner, Kara Goucher, the former Olympian, is coming forward with allegations of sexual assault against her former running coach. Our Lindsay Davis reports. She's one of the fastest female long distance runners in American history. Kara Goucher, a world championship medalist, two time Olympian, and marathoner. Running is life changing, and it's given me so much freedom and strength and power. But now in her new memoir, The Longest Race, Goucher says publicly for the very first time that she is the woman behind the sexual assault allegations that led to her once famed coach Alberto Salazar getting a lifetime ban at the Olympic and national level in 2021. Alberto Salazar was very, very powerful. He was a legend. He won the Boston Marathon. He won the New York City Marathon three years in a row. The more I got to know him, the more I really liked him. He was very personable. Goucher says she first met Salazar in 2004 when she and her now husband Adam were approached by Nike to join their prestigious running team, the Oregon Project. I became the first woman to join. Were you thinking Alberto can take me to the Olympics? The longer I was there, I really believed that he was the person that could get me there. So much so that later on, I felt like I was nothing without him. Goucher says while training with Salazar, she made great strides, running some of the fastest times of her life. But rationalizing what she says was unusual, Salazar sometimes personally massaging his athletes. I had never seen a coach give an athlete a massage, and so I just thought, He's just so dedicated, he's even willing to give his athletes massages. I kind of convinced myself that that was normal. Tell us about the moment you felt like this, this isn't normal. I was in a hotel alone with Alberto in Rieti, Italy, and he was giving me a, you know, a post-workout pre-race, what he would call a flush, and it just felt wrong. I was thinking, there's no way he's touching me like that. I'm imagining this. He's just a bad masseuse. But really, I was just sort of frozen um, not knowing what to say or do or accept that this was happening. Goucher says at the time she didn't tell anyone about the massage. I felt like maybe it was just a mistake. And even when I thought at all about telling someone, who, who would I tell? Everyone that I interacted with at Nike was male, all the way up the chain. I didn't have a single female that I interacted with, not an assistant coach, not a trainer, not a, a nutritionist, nothing. Everybody was male. But then she says it happened again, years later, while the two were in Lisbon for a race. On the flight over there, he had been inappropriate in a way that shocked me. He was telling me about uh, sexual experiences he had had, intimate details about his marriage, and I was very shocked by it. He had never spoken like that in front of me before. Um, so we get to the hotel room, and he, I do my run, and he goes to give me a massage, and it was the same situation where I felt his finger was going where it shouldn't be going. And I was so uncomfortable. And I just remember thinking, I can never travel alone with him again. I can't put myself in this situation. When I got home from that trip, I told my husband, I don't want to travel without you anymore. Goucher left the Oregon Project and says she never spoke about the alleged assaults until she was questioned by lawyers about doping allegations against Salazar as part of a U.S. anti-doping agency probe. In 2019, Salazar was suspended for four years by that agency for doping violations, allegations he has denied. 
but in 2021, he was banned for life by another agency for sexual misconduct. In her book, Goucher says that she testified about the alleged touching before Safe Sport, an organization that investigates abuse claims in sports, and that her allegations were the basis for his lifetime ban. Has he ever apologized to you? No. You know, that's really all I want. I, I just want acknowledgement and apology. I'm not angry, but it has, it has turned my life upside down. And I wish that I, wish that I could get that apology. Nike said in a statement in part, sexual misconduct has no place in sports or society and is something we stand vehemently against. Alberto is no longer a contracted coach and we shuttered the Oregon project several years ago. Mr. Salazar did not engage in any doping of his athletes and not a single Oregon project athlete was found to have violated the rules. Salazar tells ABC News in part, any claim that Ms. Goucher was sexually assaulted by me is categorically untrue. I've never sexually assaulted Ms. Goucher and never would have done so. The accusation is deeply hurtful and abhorrent and contrary to my fundamental beliefs as a husband, father and deeply devout Catholic. Is there any satisfaction for you that he will never be able to participate in the running world again? Honestly, it makes me a little sad because I know how much he loves it. I, that's his whole life. But at the end of the day, he should not be coaching. You say in the book that you finally realize that the power is not in your legs. Where have you found your power? In my voice. And our thanks to Lindsay Davis for that tonight. Also, former U.S. representative and feminist trailblazer Pat Schroeder passed away Monday night at the age of 82. The former Colorado lawmaker made a name for herself as a pioneer for women's rights in Congress, known for her wit and relentless commitment to her mission to give women a seat at the table in government. One time she was asked by a congressman how she could be a mother of two small children and a member of Congress at the same time. And she famously replied, quote, I have a brain and a uterus, and I use them both. And also tonight, we want to tell you about a really interesting podcast, How to Be a Better Human. It's not like another self-improvement podcast, right? Each episode actually dives into unexpected places for new ways to improve and show up for one another. Take a listen. I think this idea that you know we need to be happy all the time would just be psychologically and, and evolutionarily would be terrible for us, right? Like we'd be missing out on these signals that tell us what we need. And so I think what we what we need to do and what I preach a lot in the class isn't, you know, happiness isn't about being happy all the time. It's kind of having the normative emotions that come up based on situations. Oh, so refreshing to hear. So whether it be at work or at home or in your head or in your heart, guests from all walks of life join the host, Chris Duffy, to uncover sharp insights and give clear takeaways on how you can actually be a better human. And so Chris is joining us now here in the studio to unpack the latest season and discuss the actionable takeaways that all of us can use uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. Welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to have you. So this is actually the third season. And the last time you were here, you were sort of excited about about the challenge of, you know, taking those assumptions of what it means to be a better human, right? And and shaking it up a little bit. So what do you see in this season? Absolutely. I think this season we've gotten really deeper into hard issues, right? Things like yeah. grief, like loneliness, like dealing with difficult people at work and in your life. And uh, I think as we get into the bigger challenges, we start to see even more how you can have humor, you can have fun, you can have connection, but you can still tackle these really hard things. Yeah, I, and I like that, I mean, you as a comedian, I know that humor is really important throughout all of this, but in each episode, you sort of learn through your guests, right? You hear about your guests' Absolutely. own experiences and their mistakes and the things that they do well. So what sort of topics can listeners look forward to in this next season? People can definitely look forward to hearing about um, how to take um, set boundaries at work. How oh, that's a big one. That's a big one, right? Especially in jobs where, you know, it's demanding, there's lots of competition, things like there's all sorts of people that want to, to be in the space that you're Your at. work it, is 24-7. It's 24-7. You get emails in the middle of the night. Yeah. It can be hard to draw a line. And I think that figuring out, like, what are the healthy boundaries, how to do those sorts of things, I'm not very good at that at all, and that's why it's really great to talk to people who know more about this than me. As I, I referred to your podcast sort of as the no coddling zone. I mean, you were just very real, matter of fact discussions. And there was one episode about grief. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was hard to listen to at times. It was sad, but it was very, very real. And the notation that death uh, is undefeated. Mm -hmm. 
death always wins? Yeah, I think that's an important piece when you're dealing with something as, as hard as grief, right? Is that like, in the end, none of us make it out alive, right? So like, this is something that we're all gonna deal with, that we're gonna have people that we love that pass away. And, you know, I think sometimes people want to sugarcoat that and there can yeah. be this like nature of, of wanting to not talk about it or avoid the topic or just say like things are going to be better and something that i really value about our show and the conversations we get to have are sometimes we get to say there there isn't a silver lining in every cloud right. sometimes there's just a lot of clouds yeah and that doesn't mean that you can't have humor and joy and and or remember that there's still good things in the world, but it's okay to acknowledge the reality and not kind of have this toxic positivity idea that like everything's gonna be happy in the end. Well, tell me about the episode with Gretchen Rubin. I know that that was one of, uh, one of your favorites. Yeah, I love Gretchen. I think she is such an incredible um, author and she has so many great ideas about how we can like change our lives in small ways with like habits and making ourselves accountable, whether that's internally or externally. Um, Something that she talked about that I've been thinking a lot this year is she's like, people always make New Year's resolutions and then by this time in the year, they're, they're completely uh -huh. gone. We've forgotten even about them. Yeah. So instead of a resolution, she picks like a theme for her year. And so she, she said that her theme for this year was salt, which is like, okay, what does that mean exactly? And she's like, well, salt, it adds a little spice, it adds a little flavor, but also you need to put it in moderation. If you put too much in your food, it ruins it. So she's like, that's what I'm trying to do is add a little bit of spice to my, my life, but also pull back on the things that I'm doing too much of, which I love that as an idea of like taking a theme instead of a resolution. So do you have a theme for this year? My theme was warmth. Oh. So, because I think sometimes I get uh, caught up in trying to be cool. Like, I want to be cool, I want to be perceived as cool, and cool kind of keeps people away. Yeah, the laughter is really, that's the truth, right? No one has ever taken me seriously when I try and be cool. But, but when I try and be warm, when I try and be like, maybe I can be someone where people can feel like welcomed and brought in, um, I think that's a lot more successful. And that's also the person that I want to be more, because Look, it, no matter how hard I try to be cool, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, no, well, at least you know. <laughs> you agreed right you know. away. You're not supposed to agree right away. <laughs> so are you a better person after three years of doing this? I definitely think I'm better than I was. Am I better than other people? Absolutely not, but I'm, I'm improving. I think that's the idea, that you can do little pieces and it can change the way that you live your life. And I certainly have, have found that. Well, I love that. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us. And the How to Be a Better Human podcast is really, really fantastic. Worth a listen. High five for coming in the studio. Thank you so much yeah. for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find How to Be a Better Human from TED and PRX anywhere you get your podcast. And that is our show for this hour, everybody. I'm Kana Whitworth. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, what possible GOP presidential candidate Ron DeSantis said about the war in Ukraine that is raising some eyebrows, even for some in his own party. Also, actor and environmental activist Mark Ruffalo joins us with his reaction after the EPA announced it will restrict some cancer-causing forever chemicals that make it into our water supply. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? 
Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Elephants are more like us than we ever thought possible. They speak to each other in ways we're just beginning to understand. It's not just noise. It's an ancient wisdom formed over generations. They'll share their secrets with us. If we only listen. Park, California. I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everybody. I'm Kana Whitworth, and thank you so much for streaming with us tonight. And we are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour, starting with the Ohio State District Attorney saying the state will sue Norfolk Southern Railway over last month's toxic train derailment in East Palestine, a 58-count complaint, the DA's office, alleging that the railway operator violated federal and state environmental laws as well as Ohio common law. The lawsuit is said to address any economic and long-term health impact that residents may experience due to that derailment. Also in Los Angeles, prosecutors announcing felony charges in connection with a deadly COVID-19 outbreak that occurred at an upscale assisted living facility early on in the pandemic. Now the charges, which include felony elder endangerment, follow a two and a half year investigation into this outbreak at the Silverado Senior Living Management Facility. Also, a Romanian court has rejected a bail request from the divisive social media influencer and former professional kickboxer Andrew Tate who is detained in the country on suspicion of organized crime and human trafficking. Tate was initially detained in late December along with his brother Tristan and two other Romanian women. None of them have been formally charged in this case. Also today Russian fighter jets collided with an unmanned American drone over the Black Sea, risking an increase to the tensions between the U.S. and Russia. Now, these two Russian fighter planes intercepted this surveillance drone as it was flying in international airspace. The White House has accused the pilots of being reckless and unprofessional when confronting the drone, even dumping fuel on it and flying too close. One of the jets also hit the drone's propellers, forcing it down into the water. ABC's chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz, has the latest. The U.S. Reaper surveillance drone was flying in international airspace over the Black Sea when the Russian fighter jets rapidly approached and began what would be more than 30 minutes of reckless aerial harassment, much like this encounter with the U.S. B-52 bomber in 2020. Interceptions are common, but never before like this. Not only did the Russians shadow the drone, they made 19 close passes, sprayed fuel on the unmanned aircraft multiple times, while one of the jets pulling up vertically as it approached the drone, then colliding with the drone's rear propeller. They collided with the aircraft, damaging the propeller, uh, and essentially uh, putting in a situation where it was unflyable and uncontrollable, so we brought it down. The U.S. then crashing the drone into the Black Sea. The Pentagon saying the Russian fighter jet that hit it was damaged but managed to land. The big question, was this simply a reckless interception that got out of control or was the collision done on purpose? It's clear that it was unsafe, unprofessional. Um, 
and I think the actions speak for themselves. The Russians are claiming the drone was flying southwest of the Crimean Peninsula toward Russia's border and crashed because of sharp maneuvering and that the Russian jets never came into physical contact with the drone. The Pentagon says the downed drone has not been recovered by either side. Late today, the U.S. summoning Russia's ambassador to the State Department, the White House, saying that's part of keeping diplomatic lines open. That's why you want the lines of communication open, so that you can actually have those kinds of very direct interchanges uh, and lay bare and lay clean uh, what your concerns are. And our thanks to Martha Raddatz for that tonight. And while we're dealing with a lot of rain, uh, another atmospheric river here in Los Angeles, there is a nor'easter that is moving all the way up the east coast. Heavy winds, rain, they're gusting up to 60 miles an hour in some areas from Philadelphia to New York, even Boston. More than two feet of snow reported in parts of New York, Massachusetts, and Vermont. And this system will stay in that area until tomorrow. Trevor All is reporting tonight from Massachusetts. Tonight, a treacherous drive home for millions in the grip of a powerful nor'easter. Cars fishtailing in New Hampshire. Part of Interstate 93 shut down for a time, power lines blocking the road. We just came to a complete stop, um, and that was about an hour ago. Cement-like snow weighing down trees. Look at that, completely over the interstate. And taking down power lines across the northeast, putting hundreds of thousands in the dark. In some spots, nearly three feet of snow already, with hours still to go. It's really heavy, really heavy snow, heavier than usual. Moving it feels like, you know, it's a workout. At a snowy Syracuse airport, a Delta flight went off the taxiway. Fortunately, no one was hurt. He felt us kind of glide to the left a little bit, and then it felt as if we were kind of on rumble strips, similar to on the highway. And on the coast, winds gusting up to 60 miles an hour. At high tide in situate Massachusetts, officials bracing for flooding. Is this the worst storm of the season for you? Definitely the worst storm of the season. This is kind of the perfect storm with the wind, the rain, the snow. And the tides. Air travel disrupted across the country. More than 4,000 flights delayed and 1,000 flights canceled so far. Wow, our thanks to Trevor Alt for that, and we'll see how that plays out tomorrow as well. And now to the latest developments in the collapse of two U.S. banks, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. The Justice Department and the SEC today launching separate investigations into why SVB failed. It comes amid new concerns about the stability of America's banking system as a whole. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, just days after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank sparked fears of a wider banking crisis, the Justice Department and the SEC launching separate investigations. Silicon Valley Bank was not a traditional regional bank. It was rapid growth. It was poorly managed. Sources telling ABC News that part of the FBI's early focus will be looking into whether any of Silicon Valley's senior leadership got unusual bonuses or sold stocks in the days leading up to the bank's collapse. In short, is there any evidence of insider trading? We must get the full accounting of what happened and why those responsible can be held accountable. No one is above the law. Senator Elizabeth Warren now arguing any executive bonuses and stock sales should be taken back from those bankers. They took on all that risk, made themselves more profitable right up to the day that the bank exploded. And tonight, critics, including Senator Warren, point out it was easier for Silicon Valley to fly under the radar of regulators because regulations of these banks were rolled back by President Trump just 10 years after the biggest banking collapse in U.S. history. Rolled back with support from Republicans and some Democrats in Congress. And because of that, the bank no longer had to pass those key bank stress tests. These reforms are critical to helping all Americans thrive and to prosper. And for the first time, we're seeing the failed CEO of the Silicon Valley Bank addressing his employees last Friday after the government took over the bank. I care so much about all of you. It really is just so incredibly difficult. No longer in control over his bank, making last-minute pleas for his employees to hang on. So I've got an ask, and it's a completely unfair ask. My unfair ask is this, can you guys just hang around, try to support each other, try to support our clients, work together, which may be a, again, a slightly better outcome than where we are right now. 
That is quite a plea, and our thanks to Pierre Thomas for that. Turning to politics now, where Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and likely 2024 presidential candidate is making his first comments on foreign policy now, saying that supporting Ukraine is not in the vital interest of the U.S. The White House and even some top Republican senators were quick to criticize his comments. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Warm Iowa welcome to Governor DeSantis. Tonight, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is likely running for president, declared protecting Ukraine against Russia is not in the vital national interest of the U.S. DeSantis saying, while the U.S. has many vital national interests, becoming further entangled in a territorial dispute between Ukraine and Russia is not one of them. He adds the Biden administration's virtual blank check for as long as it takes distracts from our country's most pressing challenges. The White House today firing back. If we were just to lay back and let Putin take Ukraine, which make no mistake, he hasn't pulled away from it. If we just lay back and let that happen, where does it stop? The sharpest critics of DeSantis's comments, his fellow Republicans. The last thing we need is, is a bully with nuclear weapons feeling like he's emboldened and that there's nobody keeping him in check. Senator John Cornyn saying he was disturbed by the DeSantis statement. Others implying the Florida governor is out of his depth. Obviously, he's, he's busy running a big state, but if he's interested in the bigger states, he probably he probably needs to get boned up on it. Well, I don't know what he's trying to do or what the goal is. Obviously, he doesn't deal with foreign policy every day as governor. But DeSantis is staking out a similar position as his potential top rival, former President Donald Trump, who has even suggested letting Russia take over parts of Ukraine. Shortly after I win the presidency, I will have the disastrous war between Russia and Ukraine settled. It'll take 24 hours. And our thanks to you, Rachel Scott. The EPA announced today it will restrict some cancer-causing forever chemicals. They're known as PFAS. These forever chemicals do not break down. They can actually seep into soil and water. As many as 200 million Americans are exposed to PFAS in their very own tap water. Last year, the EPA found that even small amounts of these chemicals can cause problems. And exposure to these chemicals over time has been linked to severe illnesses like cancer, liver damage, high cholesterol. So this move by the EPA today, which is expected to be finalized by the end of the year, will require utility companies to remove high levels of PFAS chemicals, but they still have three years to comply. So joining us right now for more is actor Mark Ruffalo, who has been raising awareness about these chemicals in our water for years, including his 2019 movie, Dark Waters. He also serves as spokesman with the Environmental Working Group. So Mark, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kenna. Thanks for having me. Of course. Now, first, you've been, and yeah, we're so happy to have you. You've been a huge advocate, especially for a rule like this. So how critical will this be to helping millions of Americans have access to tap water that's safe? Um, well, this has been something that, you know, we've been, people have been trying to get um, to happen for many decades now. Uh, just to give you an idea of how toxic um, this co these compounds are is, uh, one part per billion is one drop in a swimming pool, Olympic-sized swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And it's one part per trillion that it, it needs to be for us to stay healthy. Uh, but it's been very difficult to get the federal government, the EPA, to um, to to issue a um, some guidance on here and regu regulations. And and now it's happening. I mean, we're still up to three years out, and we have to get through um, the comments period. But um, as far as what people have been trying to do, these frontline communities, uh, this is a this is a significant step forward. Yeah, I mean, I think what the picture you're painting is really important, right? This is a significant step, but still, we're talking about the companies are required to remove high levels of these chemicals when we know even trace amounts can cause problems. Plus, they have all these, they have some three years to do it. So mm -hmm. when we know that the step forward is significant, but we still have a long fight ahead, uh, what inspired you to actually get involved? And do you think that, you know, like public pressure from celebrities like yourself helped make this happen? Um, I do. I, I, I do feel that the movie was used as a organizing tool for the communities, the frontline communities where, um, where this is happening. These are the things we've all lived with for years. Um, 
But when we dug down into it and with the movie, we really explain it well through the story of Rob Balat, mm -hmm. uh, who, who was the lawyer who actually uncovered um, this nightmare and the malfeasance of DuPont and 3M. Um, we were able to tell the story in a way that moved people and that transcended politics. Mm -hmm. We took it to North Carolina. We took it to um, Capitol Hill. Uh, we showed lawmakers it, um, every every state it's played in, and it r skyrocketed up to um, number one on Amazon, uh, I think because people, it really did touch a nerve in people. I think it did, and it certainly brought awareness to maybe to people that perhaps didn't know. In 2019, this movie, as you mentioned there, I mean, it really hones in on the human toll, right, of these forever chemicals, and we actually have a clip to play. Let's take a look. They're going to fight every claim, thousands of claims, people, sick people. They'll give up. The system is rigged. They want us to think it'll protect us, but that's a lie. We protect us. We do. How do you think the community that you focus there on is, you know, how do they think they're feeling tonight? How do you think they are? Well, there's Emily Donahue, um, who I met uh, in, in North Carolina literally in 2019 who's been who's on a front line in the front line community um she was the one who introduced uh, michael regan uh the epa minister administrator today and i could hear in her voice as she introduced him and she told his story told her story and her family story and her community story we're talking people dying people mm -hmm. sick children drinking this stuff for for years and years and years her children um she was very moved, very emotional. Um, it's been like a specter in people's lives, this horror that has been sort of stalking them, stalking their health and uh, their health. And, and, and a lot of people didn't even know it um, until 2019 when the movie came out. It's, it's a big, huge step. And we appreciate what the Biden administration did and, and that they held to their commitments, um, but it's still bittersweet. And still a long way to go, as you uh, you clearly showcased for us. Mark, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. I'm honored to be with you. Thank you for, for uh, letting folks hear about it. And we have a lot more to get to tonight. Coming up, the virtual kidnapping scam that is causing real-life terror. And your phone is the weapon. The warning tonight and how one woman fell into this trap. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Reporting from Manhattan, I'm Diane Macedo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back. A new FBI report finds that nearly 40,000 victims lost about $55 million from extortion scams last year alone. And one of the most emotionally devastating kinds, we're talking about virtual kidnapping here. ABC News spoke exclusively with a family who was targeted. Our Ariel Reshef has that story. So good at spotting. An urgent warning from a I'm woman so who says she fell victim to an alarming scam known as virtual kidnapping. This was like the realest, scariest moment of my entire life. I was terrified that he was going to kill my sister. Beth Royce tells us her experience left her so shaken she took to TikTok to alert others. The video now with more than 6 million views. I was awoken this morning at 7.20 a.m. roughly um, to a phone call from my sister. Like it was her contact, it was her face that popped up on my phone. It looked exactly like my sister was calling. In her case, Beth said thieves hijacked her sister Kayla's actual number. The caller claiming to be holding her hostage, demanding money to free her. He sounded really erratic, so he was yelling at me a lot. He said, you're not going to tell anyone. You're not going to call the police. Um, don't tell a soul or I'm going to shoot your sister. Beth oh, seen on home security footage while on the phone with the man for 15 minutes. She alerted her mother, who was staying at her house. She was mouthing to me, they got Kayla, they're going to kill her. Beth's mom says she immediately called police and her daughter Kayla's phone to see if she would answer. She's like, where are you? Are you real? And I was like, I'm, I'm in my house in Seattle. I'm going to pay you right now. Meanwhile, outside, Beth is still on the line with the man, so panicked she transferred $1,000 for what she thought would secure her sister's safety. It went all the way through. But after sending the money and police arriving, Beth realized it was all a hoax. My mom said, I have Kayla on the phone, and I muted myself, and I yelled into my mom's phone, Kayla, are you there? Are you okay? And she's like, yes, I'm fine. And then I was like, then who does this guy have? because it sounded so real. And she said, I don't know. Authorities warn these scammers can spoof a legitimate number from your contacts, and they'll go to great lengths to stoke fear, keeping you on the phone until you agree to send a payment. The whole idea is to keep your anxiety so high, you won't think logically about whether this is real or not and pay the money. Wow, how scary. And our thanks to Ariel Resha for that important story. So they come here tonight. WNBA superstar and former NCAA champ Asia Wilson is here to talk about shining a light on the women's game and to help you fill out your March Madness brackets. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. March Madness is nearly here, and that means the annual dose of bracketology. And our next guest has teamed up with sponsor AT&T to remind everybody that your best play is to actually fill out two tournament brackets, one for the men's game, one for the women's game. And she knows a thing or two or ten about surviving the final four, right? I want to welcome Asia Wilson. And let me, just before we get started, can I please read off a few of your hoops accolades? Two-time WNBA MVP, WNBA champion this year, of course, with the Las Vegas Aces, Team USA 2020 gold medalist. Oh, yeah. 2017 NCAA, NCAA champ for the South Carolina Gamecocks. I know that's one of the things that you're the most proud of. Welcome to the show, Asia. Hi, thank you so much for having me. 
So we're going to get to your picks here in just a second, but let's start with your overall message about the importance of filling out a women's bracket also. Yes, uh, I'm actually very excited to be partnering with AT&T to make this a thing. I think when people think about brackets and they think about this time of the year, they forget about the women. Uh, and those are the women. It's equal in Magnus, equal great energy. Like, it's the same. So when people say they're filling out brackets, not just multiple men's brackets, but then tapping into the women's side because they deserve the equal amount of coverage because their games are just as crazy as the guys. So I wanted to make sure that I can continue to push the message. So for everyone out there that wants to fill out a bracket, make sure you fill out too. <laughs> I love that. I mean, the women's game really is so elevated right now. And let's not forget, though, about this viral Instagram post. We saw a Stanford coach back 2021, and it showed this glaring inequity between the gym facilities that men and women athletes have during the big tournament. And this got everyone's attention. It's not the first time we've seen something like this. But let me ask you, Asia, I mean, do you know, has this resulted in any changes at all? It has, it has, and that's normally what happens when you go viral, right? When we, when you have people to see exactly what these women go through, it kind of makes people raise the eyebrow, like, okay, why is this? Uh, so I think there is a change there. There was a big change, I think, just within the program as itself. Like, it's starting to be just the tournament and not necessarily the men and women's tournament. Now, when it comes to swag bags, I am no longer playing in the Final Four. I don't know if <laughs> swag bags but it's definitely brought shine a light on these women and their and how they play and bringing a lot more a lot more viewership to their games. Um, now the WNBA season it starts in just a couple of months. Popularity is already up, as you know. Uh, a lot of people will also be watching for the return of Brittany Griner. So she's playing for the Phoenix Mercury after she was detained in Russia, and you were among many who celebrated her release on social media. You tweeted, "BG." God is so good. So talk to me a little bit about having her back in time for the season. And you'll be facing her sometime in June, right? Yes, yes, very soon. And it's always great when we have BG back, when our sister's back. I feel like our league is now complete. Uh, and yeah. it's going to be super fun. And I know she's uh, always been a competitor and forever will be a competitor. So to have her back, I'm excited just to compete against her. and But also letting her do what she love, uh, loves at a high level. So super excited just going to see her back on the court. Yeah, it's good for the game to have her back. All right, let's see some of your picks. I mean, right? That's what we're here to talk about. Um, between your status as a distinguished alum plus their 32-0 and season, um, was it a hard choice for you when you filled out your bracket? <laughs> Not one bit. I totally went exactly. <laughs> South Carolina, that whole side of the bracket, I was like, all right, SC, like, I'm good there. Uh, I could be super biased in that point because the first time we won in 2017 was in Dallas. So it's kind of like a great deja vu coming back, uh, positive nice. vibes. So it was SC all the way. I feel like this is the perfect year for you to partner with AT&T <laughs> in all of this. And let's give a little <laughs> nod to the men's game, right? Who do you think they yes, made? Sure. Who do you think you might see in the Final Four? Who do you think could take it all? Uh, so I have Purdue taking it all. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think they have just everything, all the pieces to the puzzle to win a national championship. I think they're well coached. Uh, so I have Purdue in that situation. But when it comes to the men's side and the women's side, that's a lot of Cinderella teams. There's always a double-digit seeds uh, team somewhere in there. So I don't know. Uh, but I can't be biased on that side. So I always stay on my biased side of South Carolina. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Asia. And I'm, I'm just going to copy your bracket, OK? Thanks so much for the advice. <laughs> OK. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, and that's our show for tonight, everybody. I'm Kana Whitworth here for ABC News Live in Los Angeles. And we're here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And, of course, you can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and, of course, at abcnews.com. women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives another body in boston a killer held boston in a state of fear it was a